In this class and the next, I want to take a break from physics to um, teach you some math. Right? And this math is on the subject of uh, variational calculus. Um, so that is um, a subject that's related to the general problem of minimization. All right. So in physics, there are lots of situations where we need to minimize a function. Right. And so uh, I've already shown you examples of minimizing a free energy in the work that we've done so far. Uh, so uh, you know, related to the Ising magnets and to the gas liquid transition. Uh, and this kind of thing comes up all the time in physics, um, and not just in statistical mechanics, but it shows up in uh, optics, where um, Fermat's principle is that light rays travel from one point to another point um, in the way that minimizes the time for the travel. Um, or it shows up in classical mechanics, where one way to formulate the principles of classical mechanics is that um, a particle uh, follows a trajectory uh, which minimizes the action, where action is defined as the integral of the Lagrangian over time. Um, so this is a, a, a very general kind of situation in physics, right, where we want to um, minimize a function. And sometimes it's minimizing a function of one variable. Uh, we know what to do then, right? We calculate the first derivative and set it equal to zero. So we've had examples of that already this semester. Um, sometimes it's a function of more than one variable. So there might be a function of x, y, and z, for example and we have to minimize over x and y and z. You know what to do then from, from multivariable calculus classes, right? You calculate all the partial derivatives and set them all equal to zero. Now, sometimes it's even a little bit trickier than that, right? Where the thing that you want to minimize is not a function of one variable or a function of three variables, but it's a function of a function, right? That you have um, a whole function as input, and then the output is some number. Right? Like for example, uh, if you're thinking about Fermat's principle for optics, right? There's some path that the light ray follows from one point to another. And then um, the travel time is a function of the path. So the path is not one point or two points. It's a whole continuous trajectory to get from one place to another. And so um, you need to um, say of all the possible paths, which one gives the lowest travel time. So this is um, an interesting new kind of mathematical problem, which is uh, studied with the methods of variational calculus. Now, I'm guessing that maybe a few of you have seen this in your undergraduate curriculum, but most of you not. It's something that is not normally taught to undergraduates in the in the standard physics curriculum. Um, and so I want to take a couple of classes to show you how that's done um, in general as a mathematical principle, and then we can uh, apply it to statistical mechanics problems. Okay, so um, I'm going to start with a particular uh, example, um, which is uh, illustrated in the Mathematica that I'm going to share with you here. Uh, whoops, where is that? Here. So here is um, a, a problem that I'm calling a, a bobsled race. 
Okay, so this is a problem that I made up a few years ago, uh, the last time we had the Winter Olympics. Okay, and so in honor of the Olympics, um, I, I made up this um, math problem where we say um, there is a, a, a valley. Okay, so this picture is meant to be um, my picture of a, a, a snow-covered valley. Okay, and so on the side of the valley, here, the green point is the starting point for the race. Okay? And the red point is the ending point for the race. Okay? And so the racers are trying to get from the starting point to the ending point as quickly as possible. Okay? And they can choose what path they want to go from the starting point to the ending point. So maybe somebody might want to take a straight path across the side of the valley because they figure, well, that is the shortest possible distance. Okay? So maybe that's a good way to save time. Um, on the other hand, um, another racer might want to take a path like this to go down to the bottom of the valley and then um, the sled can pick up speed, right? And then at a high speed, you can go along the bottom of the valley and then towards the end, come back up to the top to get to the, the ending point. Um, and this might be even faster than the straight path, right? It's longer than the straight path, but it might be faster than the straight path because it's mostly down on the bottom of the valley. And so for most of the distance, the sled would have a higher speed. And so it would be you know, moving more quickly and maybe that would more than compensate for the extra distance. Okay. Um, is, is, is this problem clear enough? I mean, you don't have to see the answer yet, but you at least see the question. Yeah, right. So you can see the, the question, um, certainly for people who've grown up in Ohio and are accustomed to snow, right? They see lots of sleds and they see how sleds get pick up speed when they go down the hill, right? And they can uh, move more quickly for this part of the path and then go back up. Um, okay, but then even if you think you want to make a path like that, Still, you have to decide quantitatively um, how sharply do you go down, right? So maybe somebody might want to uh, go down really sharply like this, okay? So here's a picture where you know, the sled goes down you know, really sharply and turns the corner, and then it goes an extra long distance and then comes back up, right? Or, maybe less sharply like this or maybe smooth out the whole path like this okay so um it's uh, it's a whole path that you have to choose right you have to choose the whole function and we want to know of all possible functions that you could choose all possible um, paths, um, which one is going to give the shortest possible travel time? Okay. So that is a specific mathematical example for, uh, for us to work with today. Okay. So now, um, to, to, to set up the, the calculation, uh, let me switch over to the whiteboard. Uh, so I say share. Okay, so back on the whiteboard, here it is. Okay, so here's the, the diagram that I was um, showing you. And um, so here you see the, the path, uh, excuse me, you see the shape of the valley like this. So let's suppose that it's a, a parabolic valley. Okay, so um, X is going to be the coordinate going this way from the starting point to the ending point. Okay. 
And why is the coordinate going this way across the side of the valley? And z is the height going upwards. And let's assume that the shape of the valley is like this, that z is 1 half k y squared. Okay, so that's the parabolic shape like that. Okay, so it tells you that if you move uh, a certain amount sideways like this, then it changes your altitude, it changes your z coordinate. Okay? And so you could go down there and y equals zero is the bottom of the valley and then y negative brings you back up higher again. And so what you need to do as a racer is to choose the path y of x. Okay, so y equals a constant, that's the straight path, like that one. All right, so that, that is y equals y zero, okay, a constant. Okay. Whereas um, a path uh, like this one, that's a path where y is varying as a function of x, right? So as you go forwards in x, whoops, sorry. As you go forwards in x, um, y starts off at y naught, and then it goes down to 0, and it's 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and then back up to y naught. Um, so now we want to choose the path y of x to minimize the travel time. So step one has to be um, we need to know what is the travel time for a particular path y of x. Okay. Um, in order to figure that out, um, we have to do a calculation to know what's the speed depending on the z coordinate. Okay? And then the z coordinate depends on the y coordinate. That gives us a little bit of a basic physics problem to solve, right? And so we could say for the conservation of energy, uh, there's the kinetic energy plus the potential energy has to be a constant, right? So one half mv squared, that's the kinetic energy, plus the potential energy mgz is equal to a constant, which is whatever energy you start with. So initial energy E0. And this z is um, one half ky squared because that's the height of the valley. So we have to do a little bit of work to figure out what's the velocity in terms of y. And then figure out what's the travel time given that velocity. I don't really want to do that work here because that's not the point of what I'm teaching. Okay, so that work can be found on pages 64 and 65 of the book, right, where I, I do this basic physics plus certain approximations, but I don't really want to get into an argument about whether these are good approximations or bad approximations. Um, I just want to get to some thing to minimize. Okay, and so that gives us this expression to minimize, okay? So this t is the travel time. And um, here um, I am expressing it as um, an integral over x, right? Where x is the coordinate running from here to there. So it's an integral over x from the starting point to the ending point. 
And the thing that we are integrating um, is this quantity in the square brackets. Okay. And um, even though I'm not going to derive it here, we can talk about what each of these terms means. Okay. So um, if we look at the, the last term first, this derivative term, and we can say, well, if we want a small travel time, what makes that term to be small? Well, it, it favors um, a zero derivative, right? It favors dy dx equals zero, okay? So in other words, it favors constant y. And the reason why it favors constant y is that if there's a constant y, that gives the shortest possible distance. And that's a good thing if you're trying to minimize the travel time. Okay. So it favors this, so shortest distance. Okay, what about this term? Um, this term is the smallest when y equals zero. Right? y squared is the smallest when y equals zero. And so y equals zero, that means um, being on the bottom of the hill, right? the bottom of the valley, right? Right at the, at the, the base of the valley. Um, and that's good because um, being on the bottom of the valley means that you have the lowest potential energy, so the highest kinetic energy, so the highest speed. This term, the one, this thing is just a constant. It doesn't matter. Right? Um, it's going to be the same for all possible paths. So we don't care about that. Okay, so um, when you look at these two terms, you can see there's a kind of trade-off between them, right? If you have the shortest distance, you have to stay on the side of the valley, on the side of the hill, right? And so you don't get the highest speed, right? And so if you have the highest speed, then you don't get the shortest distance, right? So that means these two terms are, are fighting against each other. They're competing with each other. Right? And that normally happens in physics. Whenever you have any kind of minimization problem, um, it's only interesting if you have one physical effect fighting against another physical effect. And then you want to say, well, what's the best possible compromise between these two physical effects? Right? Um, and I mean, not just in physics, it's like that in, in everything in life, in, in politics, say. Um, you know, if you want to know how high should taxes be, well then, you know, there's some reason to have high taxes and there's some reason to have low taxes. And so we want to say, what's the best compromise between those two reasons? And that gives some medium tax rate. Okay. So here, we want to know what's the best compromise between these two kinds of terms that will determine the best possible path. Okay? So the travel time is a function of the whole path, y of x. Um, it is a function of a function. And a good vocabulary word for that is, is a functional. 
Okay. And so now we want to, to do the minimization to see what function y of x will give the shortest possible travel time. Okay. Now, how do we do it? Okay. Well, to, to show you how to do it, um, let me first remind you about how you minimize a function of one variable. So we'll say for the question, how to minimize. Um, let's recall if you have a function of one variable, such as, for example, f of x equals x squared. Right? That's probably the first example that you studied when you were first learning calculus. Right? So um, I'll show you first graphically, and then we'll talk about equations. Okay? So graphically, we have um, a plot like this. Right? So here is uh, f of x as a function of x. Okay. So, graphically, what we want to do is to consider some test point and say, um, is it a minimum? Okay. How do you do it, right? So, how do I know whether this point is a minimum? Right. Well, the, the standard procedure that you learn in calculus classes is you make a little change in your test point. Okay? So if you start at some value x like this, you make a little change to x plus delta x. Okay? And then you see what happens to the function. What's the change in the function when you go from x to x plus delta x. If your function decreases, well, then for sure your original test point wasn't the minimum. If your function increases, then that tells you, oh, you should have gone backwards. You should have gone to this, you know, x minus delta x, and then your function would have decreased instead of increasing. Okay, so if your, uh, you know, if f of x decreases, so if, if you know, this x, if the, the change from x to x plus delta x means x to x plus delta x, if f of x decreases, that means x was not a minimum. If f of x increases, then x was not a minimum. So the only way that x could be a minimum is if f of x is constant under this little change in x, okay? And then we would say x might be a minimum of f of x. Now, I say might be. It might also be a maximum. Right? We don't know for sure that it's a minimum, but this is the only way in which it's even possible that the test point could be a minimum. So, um, and, and this works if the quantity delta x is very small. Right? It works in the limit of infinitesimal delta x. Right. If delta x is big, then this argument kind of breaks down. Right. So 
the point of calculus is we have to consider really, really tiny delta x. And the limit of delta x goes to zero. And then this argument uh, all, all follows through. Okay. Now, let's say it mathematically. Okay. So mathematically, the idea is we're going to um, change x to x plus delta x. Right. And then there is going to be a change in the function f of x. Right. So then we will say f of x um, changes to f of x plus delta x. So that means x plus delta x squared for this particular example. And I could write that as x squared plus 2x delta x plus delta x squared. Okay. And I wrote this in three separate lines because I want to put a little commentary on each one. Okay, so the commentary for the first thing is this is the original f of x. The last line, this is a higher order term. And um, it is something which we can neglect in the limit of delta x goes to zero. Okay? This is a term which is really small. But this is the term that we care about for the purpose of the minimization, right? Because this is the term that um, tells us how does F respond to good old changes in X. Okay. And so then we, we might label that term. We say this term is something times delta X, okay? And the something gets a name. We call it the first derivative. Uh, whoops, typographical error there. We call it the first derivative, df dx. Okay. So this is the calculation which tells us that the first derivative of x squared is 2x. Right, you already knew that. And then it tells us the only way that we can have a minimum is if the thing that goes here in this blank is equal to zero. All right. So we um, must have, here, I'll make it in another color, we, we must have df dx equals zero, okay? Therefore, 2x equals zero, therefore x equals zero, okay? So this is you know, how we calculate the minimum of f of x equals x squared, okay? Now, what about um, a function of, of three variables, okay? So if we say, Let's remember, um, uh, how do we do this for a function of three variables? So sum f of x, y, and z. Well, um, it's basically the same idea that is, we make small changes in all three 
of the variables. So x goes to x plus delta x. And y goes to y plus delta y. And z goes to z plus delta z. Okay. Then f has a small change. Then f of x, y, and z goes to f of x plus delta x and y plus delta y and z plus delta z. Okay. And now we can expand that the same as we did for the function of one variable. We can say this is equal to the original f of x, y, and z plus something times delta x plus something times delta y plus something times delta z plus higher order terms. Okay, so now I can analyze this expression the same way I analyzed this expression over here with the three lines, right? I can say the first line, uh, the first line here, this is just the original before the change. For the third line, I can say this is something small which we can neglect for uh, small values of the three increments, delta x, delta y, and delta z. Okay. So the part that is important for the minimization is the middle line this plus this plus this, okay? And so we need to look at what goes in the blanks, right? What are the, the things that we put in those blanks, the coefficients of delta x, delta y, and delta z. And as you learn in multivariable calculus courses, um, those three things are called the partial derivatives. So this partial derivative is the partial of f with respect to x. This thing is the partial of f with respect to y. This is the partial of f with respect to z. Now, um, if we want the minimum, okay, so um, let's say, can x, y, z be a minimum? Only if, that's only possible if the function stays the same no matter what little changes of x, y, and z we make, right? We could change just x. We could change just y. We could change just z. We could change them in any diagonal direction, right? So the only, it's only if this second line equals zero for all possible delta x, delta y, delta z. And that is only going to be true if all of these coefficients are equal to zero. Right? So 
we must have d, whoops, df dx equals zero and df dy equals zero and df dz equals zero. Right. These three equations are necessary to have a minimum. Now, they don't prove that the point is a minimum. The point still might be a maximum or a saddle point, but they are necessary. Okay. So whatever f of f f of x, y, and z function we have, we want to calculate all three of the partial derivatives and set all three of them equal to zero. And that will give us three equations in three unknowns. Okay, and that will be um, a necessary condition to solve this minimization problem for a function of three variables. Okay, you good with this so far? Okay, so this, this was meant to be review of your multivariable calculus course. Okay, so now we get to do the new thing. Okay, so now we have um, uh, well, let's, let's say um, T depends on the whole function Y of X. Okay. So we want to say, um, how can we possibly be at a minimum? Well, let's try making a little bit of a change to this function. Okay, so we're not going to keep the same path. We'll change to a slightly different path. Okay, so we will um, make a small change. That is, instead of the path y of x, we'll go to y of x plus delta y of x. So that is to say, if our um, original path, y as a function of x, you know, from this point to this point, right? If our original path is like that, we'll change to a slightly different path, maybe a path like that. Okay, so the, the black one is uh, y of x and the red one is y of x plus delta y of x, okay? So it's different from the original path almost everywhere, right? So, um, but the difference is small, okay? And so uh, I just have this little increment delta y as a function of x. And then we want to see what does it do to the travel time. So that means that the travel time changes um, it goes from t um, t of y of x to t of y of x plus delta y of x. And now we want to analyze this travel time the same way that we did before, okay? We want to say that this t of y of x plus delta y of x, the new travel time, that this is the old travel time, 
before we made the change, plus a little increment that's proportional to delta y, plus higher order terms. Okay, now, how can we write the increment, right? We can't just write the increment is something times delta y of x, because, you know, what x goes there, right? I mean, it, it matters what's the change of the path everywhere, not just the change in the path at any one place, right? So, instead, let's write it as an integral over everything, okay? So, it's the integral from the starting point to the ending point, dx, of something times delta y of x. Okay. And then the only way that we could be at a minimum is if this something, the coefficient, is zero everywhere. Right? Otherwise, there'd be some opportunity to reduce the travel time. So, um, the thing that goes in this blank gets a name in variational calculus, and it gets a, a, a symbol, okay? So, the, the name, well, the name of that is the functional derivative And it is written as um, delta t by delta y of x, like that. Okay. So it's how the travel time depends on y of x. So we want this thing to be zero everywhere. Um, so that the path y of x can be a minimum. Okay, so we have a procedure kind of like what we do for a function of one variable or a function of three variables or any number of variables. We want to calculate the thing that goes in this blank and then set it equal to zero. So, how do we make that calculation? Okay, well, let's, let's work with the particular equation that I showed you for the travel time here. Okay, so I will lasso it this. Uh, and copy, and then I'll paste. Good. Um, okay, so um, here is the um, original equation for the travel time. Okay? And now I want to know what happens to this equation um, if I change y of x to a function y of x plus delta y of x. Okay. So um, that means the travel time for y of x plus delta y of x here on the right side, I want to substitute in y plus delta y everywhere where it used to be just y. Okay? So it's this m over 2 e naught to the half the integral 1 plus mgk for e naught uh, y plus 
delta y squared plus a half. Uh, and here it's dy dx plus d delta y dx squared. Okay, now I'm going to expand all of these uh, squares in parentheses and um, write each of the things on three lines, right? Same as I did before. Okay. So this is all equal to m over 2 e naught square root integral. Okay, now uh, I'm going to um, copy out all these things on the three lines. So there's 1 plus mgk over 4 e naught y squared. Okay. And then um, in this thing in parentheses, uh, I will, uh, you know, there's a cross term, which is 2y delta y. So I'll put it here. Plus mgk over 4 e naught times 2y delta y. And then there's a term like mgk over 4 e naught times delta y squared. Okay. Now for the derivative uh, part. Okay. For the derivatives, I'll say plus 1 half dy dx squared. Now there's um, a cross term. So plus one half, and the cross term is two times dy dx times d delta y dx. And then there's a term of uh, a half d uh, delta y dx squared. Okay, so now you see um, this stuff is equal to all of this stuff. Okay, now I can interpret the three lines the same way that I did before. Okay, so um, this thing is the original travel time. before I made the, the change. This line is the um, higher order term, which I will neglect for small functions delta y of x. Right, if this function is small, then we can neglect something that looks like delta y squared, and we can look so, neglect something that looks like the derivative of delta y squared. So the line that I care about is uh, this line. Okay, so uh, this is the uh, important line. So now I want to write this line in this format right here. I want to write the line as something times delta y and then see what's the something. Well, let's see. For this term, ooh, no problem. It already looks like something times delta y. That's great. For this term, oh, there's a little bit of a problem, okay? The little bit of a problem is it doesn't look like something times delta y. It looks like something times the derivative of delta y, all right? So um, I need just a little bit of work 
to get it into the right format, okay? And I'm gonna do that for the last thing for today, okay? So if I wanna get that into the right format, um, I'll do a little subcalculation over here, okay? So if I have something which looks like the integral from minus x naught to x naught dx, okay? And the thing that I'm integrating is dy dx times d delta y dx. Uh, d delta y dx. Okay, the trick for um, manipulating this integral is to integrate by parts. Okay, so you guys learn integration by parts in your first year calculus classes, right? Okay, good. So you, you know that um, the general principle when you um, integrate by parts is that um, the integral of u dv is equal to u v minus the integral of v du, right? Okay, that's sort of familiar to you, I think. Okay, so here um, I want to say that, um, let's see, u is equal to dy dx and dv is the derivative of delta y dx times dx. Okay. So then um, v is just to, to integrate um, this thing, so that's just delta y. Okay. And the du is the second derivative of y with respect to x times dx. Okay, so then following the uh, integration by parts, that tells us that um, this integral that we want is equal to um, u times v, so dy dx times delta y minus the integral of delta y times du, so that's the second derivative of y with respect to x dx. And these are definite integrals. So this is the integral from minus x naught to x naught. And this is evaluated from minus x naught to x naught. Okay. Now, for this boundary term, for the first term, we can use a kind of boundary condition on the race right, that you know, the racer has to start at the starting point and end at the ending point. You can't change the path there or there or else you'll just miss the whole race, okay? So that means that for the race, we must have delta y equals zero at x equals plus or minus x naught at the starting point and at the ending point. So because of that boundary condition, um, we therefore the, uh, the first term vanishes, or the first term is equal to zero, okay? So, um, We don't have to worry about that. And what we are left with is therefore just the second term, this integral of, um, I'll 
I'll change the order of the factors. The second derivative times delta y integrated dx. And this now is just what we were looking for. It's something times delta y. All right. So now to combine the terms, um, if I go back to saying, what is this middle line that I care about? Right, that line becomes um, the, the change in the travel time. So t at y of x plus delta y of x, that is the original travel time plus, um, well, what's this uh, square root? m over 2 e naught square root, the integral from minus x naught to x naught. Okay. And then, um, let's see, I have this uh, first piece. So, m g k over, what is it, 2, 4, e naught, uh, times y, uh, multiplied by delta y of x integrated dx, All right? Did I copy that correctly? Uh, oops, I forgot a factor of 2. Eh. Okay. I hope I got that right. Okay, and then we have the other term that came from this integration by parts, which is negative because of this minus sign that comes from the integration by parts. Okay, so minus, okay, minus the second derivative of y with respect to x. So, in this bobsled race, this quantity is the functional derivative of the travel time with respect to y of x. Okay. So, we get the equation, we must have the derivative of t, derivative of t with respect to y of x equals zero. So mgk over 4e naught times 2y um, minus the second derivative of y with respect to x squared equals zero. So this then is a differential equation that must be satisfied at the minimum point. The name for the differential equation that we get from doing this minimization problem is the Euler-Lagrange equation for this problem. Okay. So this is a differential equation that we have to solve. Now, at this point, you're thinking to yourselves, what is a differential equation? I thought this was going to give us the answer, right? But, well, you know, in regular calculus, when you set the first derivative equal to zero, that gives you an algebra equation. But you still have to solve the algebra equation to get the answer, okay? So here, when we're doing variational calculus, and we do this work to set the functional derivative equal to zero, it gives us a differential equation, which is named the Euler-Lagrange equation. And we still have to solve it to get the answer. And I will do that on Monday. Okay, so I'm gonna stop talking for now. I'm sorry for going over time. 
and I'll be glad to answer any questions. Uh, as you told me, this uh, solving this Euler Lagrange equation is is necessary, but it's not sufficient, right? Uh, to to get the minimum point uh, of this uh, functional. So, what is the uh, sufficient condition to find out the minimum point, uh, the minimum uh, function for this functional? How how could we prove that this is um, uh, a minimum and not a maximum? Right. Uh, could you please go back to page six? Uh, sure. Okay. Uh, I think for for this particular functional, uh, we can see the higher order terms are positive definite. So um, as long as the first derivative, uh, uh, the first functional derivative is zero, then it must be a minimum, right? However, if what if there is a term like delta y times uh, the derivative of delta y with respect to x, that would make the higher order term um, not positive definite, right? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, I'm, I'm sure there's a whole body of um, theorems about that, but um, I'm not um, extremely familiar. Right. So um, I can say a, a couple of answers. Right. So um, in in practice, with many kinds of problems in liquid crystal physics or statistical mechanics, um, you know, you you're dealing with functions that have a minimum but don't have any maximum. Uh, and so, for example, this travel time, thing, right? You, you, you can say physically, there, there must be some travel time that gives the shortest time between these points, but there's no maximum because, you know, you could always take some totally crazy right. path right. and make right. the, the travel time even longer. Uh, and so, um, very commonly in physics, there's some physical reason to think that there's a minimum, but there's no maximum. And so whatever solution you get must be a minimum and not, not a maximum. All right. so, so that's one kind of practical answer, but it's not a, not a theoretical answer. Mm -hmm. um, for a more theoretical answer, um, I mean, you could construct something like the analog of a second derivative, right? And, and that's what you were basically doing when you were um, looking at those higher order terms, right? And so you could look at the second functional derivative and see what mathematical properties does it have? And does it make something which is positive, definite, or not? Um, in principle, I think that should work. Um, I don't really have experience with that in my own research. Um, usually in my own research, I have you know, more practical situation where um, it's clear whether something is a, has to be a minimum or not a maximum. But it's a, it's a great question you know, in, in general as a mathematical principle.